And uh, one he told us was it isn't a uh, it isn't a, a scary story, but one that I really it really stuck in my mind was about a guy that was in, this happened in the states. This guy went and visit also a cousin. He went and visit a cousin, and when uh, you know they were sitting in a tent, they they were staying in tents. So he was sitting in a tent, and this guy was cleaning his gun, a rifle. So his cousin went out to go take a leak. But, uh, you know, when he went out of the tent, and this guy was cleaning his gun, and it accidentally went off, and it hit the guy that was outside. So he says, uh, you, you got me good. You know, you really got me good, he says, you know, so... He, when he ran out to see, well, of course, he was hit pretty good. He knew he wasn't going to live. So he told his cousin, you better run. He said, the police are not going to believe you that it was an accident. You better go. Because he knew he was dying, so he didn't want his cousin to get in trouble. Not, there was no other way he can help me. He knew he was going to die right away. So this guy took off. He ran. Now, he used to run. He used to go from the States, come all the way to Canada. And, uh, you know, he made a round trip that way. This guy was on foot. He wasn't, uh, you know, he didn't have a horse or nothing. So finally he was suffering so much that he gave up. You know, he gave up. So he took a little blanket. He went on top of a hill where he figured, well, they'll find me here if it comes spring. You know, this wasn't the wintertime. All he had was a little blanket. So he said, well, if I die here, they're going to find me in spring because it was right on top of the hill. So he just curled up he, with his little blanket. He curled up and he, was, uh, he went to sleep. He figured it would freeze to death anyway. So before he got too cold, he heard a noise. He heard a noise coming, you know, like you could hear somebody walking in the snow. And uh, it come and lay beside him. And it, it come and lay beside him. So he didn't move. He just laid there. He didn't even move. And uh, shortly after, you heard some more, another noise. And four, four of them come. There was four timber wolves. Okay, four prairie wolves that came. And... Uh, Slept one slept on each side of him, one, one slept at the head, one slept at the foot. And that kept them from freezing all night. You know, that kept them from freezing. Those wolves kept them warm. The next morning, when he got, as soon as he moved, well, the wolves got up and walked a little ways away. But they didn't run away from him. So, and when he started walking, the wolves kept, the wolves followed him. You know, the, the wolves followed him. And he'd kill a jackrabbit or whatever. He'd roast some, and then he'd, give, he'd share it with his wolves, eh? And, uh, you know, he, he kept going. The wolves kept, kept with him, stayed with him. And when he come to a settlement or a camp, you know, he used to, there used to be camps. When he came to a camp, well, the wolves would disappear. You know, they wouldn't come close to a camp. Where, when he hits people where he knew the people, so he'd go there. And everybody would help him because they all liked him. They knew it wasn't his fault. He... And the wolves would disappear. But when he leaves that camp, when he's all alone, the wolves would find him. I guess they were watching from a distance or something, or they'd find him and they'd follow him and they'd keep him warm all winter. You know, they'd, they'd keep him, they'd protect him also from all, all winter. And he'd shoot something and he'd share with his wolves. You know, and the guy had a wife in the States. He had a wife, a couple of wives in Canada because that was his round, that the way he had to run. So one summer day, he was in a tent with one of his wives when he heard the police outside. You know, they knew he was in there. So he always, everybody at that, them, them years, they had a knife. You know, they had it in a knife and they had rifles, you know, these old rifles. So he grabbed his knife and he slit this tent, you know, and from behind and got out and he ran. And the horses chased him, they couldn't catch him. You know, this guy was on foot. He didn't even know he had all that speed. See, probably he had that. He got that speed from the from the prairie wolves. He didn't know when he had that speed. He was able to beat them horses, and they chased him, and he left them. He was on foot, and the mounties were on were on horseback. And this this was true. The, I I met that we saw his son, didn't we, Mom? When we went to the states, that same guy that I'm talking about. We saw I saw his son. But they, he was already dead when I, before I was even born. And, uh, you know, from there on, he knew he had all the speed that the, the, a horse couldn't catch him because at them years, that's all they had was horses. They had no cars, no phones, 
no nothing. So all they had was horses. They could never catch him. He ran for nine years, he ran. And that time, if you, if you were able to get away for ten years, you were a free man, regardless what you did. If they couldn't catch you within ten years, you were a free man. But he suffered so long, he suffered himself so long, and he was so tired of, you know, suffering himself, that he decided, well, he gave up. He was going to give up. He took his rifle and everything, he walked to, the, to town, went and gave himself up. Went and gave himself up to the law. Told them who he was, what he'd done, because they all know, because they were all after him. So the, the police did the, just looked at him and told him, you know, you've ran and suffered for nine whole years. He says, here's your rifle, here's some bullets, here's some money, you go home, look after your wife. They let him go. But he suffered himself for nine solid years. And them coyotes, them uh, prairie wolves, they were always with him. They, were, they never did leave him till he gave himself up. And afterwards, he never did see them again, eh? He would, you know, they disappeared. He never seen them again. But his son couldn't run no faster than I, I couldn't. He couldn't even run as fast as me because he was limping. He had a bad leg. But he, I met, I met this this guy's son. You know, and this is a true story. This really happened. But he would never enter a race where they'd want him to run against somebody to see how fast he could run. He'd never enter a race. He'd never enter to just for competition. He ran for his life only. Never for competition. They were, they were, he wasn't supposed it to wasn't meant. It wasn't meant for him to make money in running. You know, that wasn't meant for him to do that. No. It was meant for him to save his life. That's what they. That's what gave him the speed. If he would have, if he would have joined a, a running competition where he would have made money, you know, just to compete, he would have lost his speed. He would have lost everything. But this, uh, his son was alive. I don't know if that guy had kids, but. Uh, we met, I met his son, I was just young of course, we went to the States, I went with mom and dad and uh, that's where we met him, at a Sundance, yeah, at, a, at a Sundance we met him, he'd walk around and wake up the people, he'd say, ha, one sky, you know, he'd say, ma, wake up now, you know, I saw my pan, it's daylight already, and uh, see, it's stories like this that, uh, I didn't forget because my dad told us this story. My dad knew the the people. He knew everybody. He knew a lot of people from the states because that's where he was from.